So far we've looked at primitive recursion, things where you can use recursion if you want to, but you don't have to because it can be derecursed and turned into an iterative for loop. And we did factorial and we did Fibonacci, both of which are primitive recursive in this sense. And there would be a great danger in thinking, well, surely you can do anything then in for loops, why bother with recursion at all? Well, there are some things which are so fundamentally recursive that you just have to do them recursively. It became clear to mathematicians really at the turn of the last century about the nature of functions in general that there were some things that were so, if you like, huge, so enormous, so badly behaved that they just had to be recursively defined. And I think one of the earliest people to realise this was a research student of David Hilbert's. Now, who is David Hilbert? We're back on number flow territory again. Probably, perhaps, the greatest mathematician of the late 19th and early 20th century. He was a phenomenal uh, mathematical genius, capabilities and so on. He was at Göttingen in Germany, and I think I'm right in saying that Ackermann was one of his research students. And it's Wilhelm Ackermann's function that we're going to look at today. The test was, can you come up with something that just has to be done totally recursively? You can't do it, as it were, in a for loop, even though those haven't been properly invented at that stage. What became clear as a result of work started by Ackerman and by others is that we've got a hierarchy of program types. Right down at the bottom, the simple ones we've seen, the ones that can be derecursed, these are primitive recursive. There's a whole layer on top of that where they're functions where you just have to define them recursively. Just above this set are the recursively enumerable functions. Let's be clear here, by saying primitive recursive at the bottom, I'm including every other program that isn't recursive. I'm regarding a thing that just goes through a sequence as being a very simple example of a primitive recursive program with no real recursion in it. And anything that's got for loops or nested for loops, well actually, you could have done that recursively. And probably languages like Haskell do, for all I know. Uh, but they, they still count as the simplest form of program. Primitive recursion, if it's got recursion in there at all, you could always derecurse it, make it into for loops. This next thing, recursive, on top of that, there's an even more problematical set of programs above that, which says they're recursive, but for some values of the arguments you put into the function, they will stop and give an answer. And for others, they will go on forever, and they will never ever stop. To how, how do you define forever then? Go on. Forever and ever and ever, they will go into just repeating the same old stack frames and you may not be aware of it, and just go round and round and round. And then you'll say, but how can I decide ahead of time for given arguments whether it will stop or won't? And the answer is, hello Alan Turing, in general that may well be undecidable. So above here, out in hyperspace, is the great undecidable. <laughs> universe. There are some problems you can set in computing that just are not decidable at all, not by any algorithm. And one of the great names in this was Kurt Gödel in the early 1930s. And the second great name for computer scientists that linked Gödel's work with how computer programs worked and with his Turing machines was Alan Turing. He wrote a famous paper in 1936 about his Turing machines, referred back to Kurt Gödel's work and basically said, there are some things in computing that are undecidable. But for the moment, we're coming in here at the next level above primitive recursive. I'm going to take a look at a recursive function where I can reason through with you that it will give an answer. It's not in the nasty set above it, the recursively enumerables, where sometimes it would go wrong and just end up spinning and not doing anything useful. This thing, and this is a good introduction as well to the way that theoretical computer scientists, of which I'm not one, but I'll try and give you the flavour about how you can reason about programmes and how they behave, even without actually executing them. The 
version of Ackermann's function that tends to be used nowadays, the one modified by Peter and by Robinson, here is where all the hard work occurs. This is the recursive function itself. We declare ACK for short, a function with two incoming integer arguments. And here, look, it delivers back an integer result. It delivers back the integer result in its local variable that it declares for itself for holding the answer. And eventually, of course, look, it's going to return the answer. But how does it do its recursive horrors? If the incoming argument m is 0, then deliver back the integer answer n plus 1. So if I came in with Ackerman 0, 2, because the m is 0, it would deliver back 2 plus 1, 3. Easy. Otherwise, if that isn't true, if m isn't 0, if it's any other integer, else, if n is 0, then the answer is what you get by calling up Ackerman recursively again, but this time by reducing the first argument by 1. Call up Ackerman with m minus 1, not m, and with the first argument 1. Otherwise, now that's bad enough, but here comes the real killer. If m isn't 0, and if n isn't 0, what's the general case? The general case is that the answer is Ackerman of m minus 1. Notice you're reducing m again, look. And this is where headaches start to set in. This blows your brain and makes you realise why you can't de-recurse this into iteration. The second argument for that generalised call of Ackerman is itself a call of Ackerman. So you have to go through endless thousands of stack frames to calculate just what the second argument must be to another call of Ackerman that's going to go through the same agony all over again. Now, I think you can mentally visualise just what a huge amount of computation might be involved here and how big the numbers might get to be. But what I would like to just draw your attention to, because this is important, is that every time m and n are altered in going round recursively, they reduce. We found out that on the second line it says if n was 0, then you called up a thing with Ackerman of m minus 1 in it. Yeah? So you're reducing m at that place. And even in the horrible worst case, the third line, you reduce the first argument to m minus 1, and within that vile second argument, it's Ackerman of m, n minus 1. So as you go around this, if m and n change at all, they are reduced. Therefore, if your first two traps, which we've got here, are for when m gets down to zero and when n gets down to zero, then in the end it will terminate. So long as you feed in positive integers for m and n. Now, as ever, I have done no error checking, whatever. That's down to you. I want you to concentrate on this. Yeah, if you put negative in numbers in there, boy, are you in for a rough old ride. Yeah, it's got to be positive integers. Zeros are fine, but it must be zero or positive integers. Although this is a huge recursive mess with millions of stack frames, nonetheless, by reasoning and saying that when these values are altered, they always alter downwards, you can convince yourself that this will eventually deliver an answer. Now, the only trouble is that in delivering an answer, there may be a huge amount of computation involved, particularly when we get onto this third line, and you have to run Ackermann's function in order to work out what an argument to Ackermann's function is going to be. And just to show you how bad this gets, I've set up two nested for loops on i and j, taking i from 0 through to 5, actually, because it's i less than 6, j from 0 through to 5, and I call up the Ackerman function as the argument to be printed in the standard piece of text here. So you'll get things like Ackerman 0, 0 is whatever, and you call up Ackerman recursively to work it out. So how's that going for you? How is that going for me? Well, what Steve and I, Dr. Heartbleed, as we now call him, <laughs> we set this going four weeks ago, nearly now. The first few have vanished off the top. You'll be delighted to know that Ackerman of 0, 3 is a value of 4, that Ackerman of 2, 2 is 7, Ackerman of 3, 2 is 29, doesn't look too bad. 
Now, it did have a bit of a gasp for air between 4.0, which is 13, and it finally decided that Ackerman 4.1 was 65,533. It still took it, recursively, on this machine, three minutes to work out that Ackerman 4.1 was 65,533. So, this is progress, because this, of course, is a fairly modern quad-core Pentium, or whatever it is, running Linux. The previous machine I had when I first tried this, about seven or eight years ago, was a venerable Sun spark blade. And the spark blade, miracle of its age, took 20 minutes to work that out. So 20 minutes, three minutes, we're progressing. And then, you know, I was looking at this with Steve. We've set the thing going, it's still running. And I said, oh, you know, it probably won't be that bad. It'll be, if it took three minutes to work out something whose answer was 65, 533, it'll take about maybe 65,000 times three minutes to work the next one out. And did a few calculations. Yeah, about four months on this machine, something like that. Uh, no, I've just looked into it more deeply and reminded myself of the appalling properties of the Ackerman function when it starts to build. No. It will take 2 to the power of 65,533 times 3, 3 minutes per go. It will take 3 times 2 to the 65,533 minutes to work out that value. That is unimaginably huge. It's no good saying it's astronomical. It's way beyond astronomical. The number of particles, I think, including all dark matter, isn't more than about 2 to the 300, something like that. The number of seconds since the Big Bang is probably about 2 to the 500 or 600, at most. Not 2 to the power of 65,533. But what's going to happen eventually? 2 to the power 65,533 is such a big number. So we're going to start getting wrong answers. We'll either get overflow happening, or perhaps if integer overflow isn't signaled to us, you know, integer numbers sometimes tend to roll over the top and go negative. So who knows what will happen. I'll probably stop this off now when we made this video because frankly, I have not, I don't think I'm going to survive for 2 to the power of 65,533 minutes multiplied by 3 for this to come to an end. I think the astronomers will probably say the big crunch when the universe all gets down to a dot again. Even that is probably going to happen in about another two to the power few hundred. This sort of behaviour is often called super exponential. One of the ways of indicating that a function probably has to be done recursively and can't be done in for loops is when it starts behaving super exponentially. Not just like n to the power n, which will be exponential, but n to the power of 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 n done n times. And your brain just collapses and refuses to even contemplate what that means. In fact, I've noticed one commenter, thank you whoever it was, when somebody said, uh, surely you can do anything in four loops, what do you have to do totally recursively? Somebody's picked up, I think, one of those numbers I don't know much about, really big ones called Googles and Googleplexes, but they've been covered in number five and said, how about Ackerman of G64, I think it's called. How about Ackerman of G64, G64? The arguments before you ever start inflating them are still absolutely astronomical. But the really interesting thing is that although we can never know what the answer is, and the answer to 2 to the 65,000 whatever, divided by 3, that is going to involve 20,000 decimal digits when it finally comes out way beyond the big crunch. But by reasoning with the program in the way we did, we know it is not uncomputable. Think back to the original hierarchy. Because we can never know the answer to some of these values, does it mean it's uncomputable? No. Uncomputable means there is no algorithm for doing it. Ackerman is a perfectly good algorithm. You can prove it terminates. It's just none of us are going to be around long enough to find out what some of those values are. Oh, I don't know what factorial 3 is. It's 3 times factorial 2. So I've got to know what factorial 2 is. You go into so here's the and you draw an arc 
and you end up with this beautiful looking spiral known as the Fibonacci spiral. 